That's what I do. Okay. All right. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for being here today. I really appreciate you taking the time to attend my thesis defense. And today I'm going to be presented to you the work I've been doing for the past six years or so on the field of computational nanoplasmonics for biosensing applications. And along this, this presentation, hopefully you'll understand better all the terms that are on this title right now. And I hope that you can get, you can grasp an idea of what all the results that we, we've been gathering. So when we started with this project, we have one main research goal, which was to be able to provide a computational approach for biosensing applications. And the reason why we concentrate on this, it's because for the last 20 to 30 years, the field of biosensing has gained a big relevance and it has many applications in medicine, pharmaceuticals, food industry, and so on. But this field is mainly an experimental field. And we were hoping that by providing a computational approach that has realistic representations of the analyte, we will be able to aid on the design of biosensors that uh, with, a, with a tool that will be much cheaper than continually running experiments for different configurations. And along the way, we will also study what are the possibilities of simple models and reduce order models and how this affects uh, the outcomes of, of their LSPR response, which I'm gonna get into right now. Now, if we're talking about biosensors, we need to understand what a biosensor is. Now, there are many types of biosensors, but the common denominator on all of this is that they use a biomolecule as a recognition element, which means that uh, we will get a signal that will be displayed uh, when there are no elements binding to this, uh, uh, to this biomolecule. And when there is an analyte binded, we will see a shift on this signal. That's like the principal, um, the principal phenomenon that happens behind any biosensor. Now, a common type of biosensors is a call, is the one that are based on surface plasmon resonance, which use as a, a substrate, and then they have a gold film where they functionalize the surface with this biomolecule components that will then recognize the, the analyte. Now, when we replace this gold film for small nanoparticles or metallic nanoparticles, it's been shown that the sensitivity is much higher. And this approach is interesting to us because on the field of localized surface plasma resonance, it could be approximated by electrostatics under certain circumstances. So what is LSPR or as defined localized surface plasma resonance? When we have a small nanoparticle, a metallic nanoparticle, and we shine the nanoparticle with <clears throat> an electric field or like, a, like incoming light, what we see is that the electrons on the surface of the nanoparticle start oscillating and they resonate with the incoming electric field generating plasmons. Now, when the wavelength of incoming electric field is much bigger than the size of the nanoparticle, the nanoparticle sees as if it only has an electric field affecting it. Now, this effect, what, what will cause is that we will have an, <clears throat> an extinction cross-section curve. We will get into the details of what extinction cross-section is, but it's a signal that it varies across the wavelengths uh, due to the changes on the dielectric on the surrounding. Now, when we modify the electrics, uh, the dielectric in the surrounding, this signal will shift. And that's like the sensing principle behind um, this type of biosensors. Now, as I mentioned before, when we have a wavelength that is much longer than the size of the nanoparticle, we can model this process uh, with electrostatics. And here down below, you see the first equations I'm gonna show you where we, they are really, really similar to what models electrostatics. And the difference is that here now we have an incoming electric field and that this, the electrics, E2, epsilon two and epsilon one, now 
are complex the electrons. Now, how do we go from the electrostatics modeling to something that we can put in the computers and, and, and use it for computations? When we have uh, a curl-free uh, vector field, like in the case of electrostatics, in this case, we can, we can express it as a scalar potential. And this makes it a good candidate to express it in terms of the boundary integrals, which is the perfect choice to use boundary element methods to perform computations. Now, here's just as a, as, as a display, we will, we will transform our potentials in terms of the green functions and the derivative of the green functions. Now, how do we go from solving for the potential to getting these extinction curves that are the ones that are going to give us the information? We solve the potential using our boundary element methods and our boundary integral approach. And with, once we solve for the potential, we can compute the dipole moment P that allow us to compute the electric field, the scatter electric field in the, in the surroundings. And the scatter electric field, when R tends to infinity, like in the far field, is connected with the forward scattering amplitude, which is what we need to compute the extinction cross section. So the optical theorem is what we can, would allow us to connect our potential solution to the extinction cross section. Now we implemented all this bound and trivial formulation. Uh, the bound and trivial formulation was implemented before uh, on the Sol solver Pigby, and it was used for electrostatics of biomolecules and the study of the electrostatics of biomolecules. Now, we made use of this approach and the boundary element method implemented in there to add on the new applications for nanoplasmonics, but making, making certain uh, modifications. This solver is an open source software, and every, every source that we have obtained with this solver follow reproducibility practices. And uh, one more thing to add in terms of the solver is that it's accelerated uh, in terms of the hardware using I mean, GPUs via PyCuda. And then uh, at, the, at the algorithmic level, it's accelerated with a tree code. Now, to be able to add this new application into the code, we needed to do certain modifications. The main modifications we did was a rewrite of the full GMRAS solver, which needed to accept complex numbers, which it wasn't implemented before. We split the tree code into real and imaginary parts and performed those computations separately. We reformat all the configuration files to include the new parameters uh, for this new physics, such as electric field and wavelength, modify accordingly the right-hand side, and also added the functions to be able to compute the dipole moment and the extinction cross-section, and finally bundle most, uh, most of the, the main script to call for this routine into one separate file. Now, the first step in order to know that we were solving the equations right was to perform a verification analysis. We, we wanted to make sure that we're solving the equations right. And for that, we use uh, a, an analytical solution for the case when we have an isolated nanoparticle. In this case, we use a silver nanoparticle due to the fact that we were able to find the, the electric constants for the different wavelengths in the literature. And with the me theory and the Mishenko correction, uh, we have this equation here that allowed us to compare to. So we proceed to firstly perform a convergence analysis to make sure that we are not introducing errors due to the, the, due to the mesh and the discretization of the mesh. So we refine all the algebraic tree code and integration parameters to a high level and then we study how the error varied compared to the analytical solution when we were increasing the number of, of uh, elements in our mesh. As you can see, we obtained uh, order of, we, we could see convergence and, oops, and 
we were able to obtain errors below 1% for a mesh of over 32,000 elements. Now, once we are sure that we're not introducing, introducing discretization errors, we, we perform computations across all the wavelengths, but in this case, we relax the algebraic uh, integral integration and trickle parameters such that the computations will get faster, but we still are within an error below 1%. Uh, as you can see here on the right, like our computations match almost perfectly the analytical solution. And each of these computations takes approximately 30 seconds. Now, we wanted to study not only how a nanoparticle, uh, the nanoplasmonics of an isolated nanoparticle, but how the response of the extinction cross-section varied when we added a protein in, in the vicinity. Now, here I'm not intending you to understand all this equation, but what I expect to show you is once we introduce another particle in the vicinity, the equations get much more messier, but we could still see this two by two block pattern and then the outer interactions between the particles. Now, we want to see if we could obtain the shift on the extinction cross-section once we put a, a protein in the vicinity. So again, we perform a convergence analysis for a setup that is a protein and a sensor. For the choice of the protein, we, we, we found only data for bovine serum albumin, and we obtained the electrics for that uh, protein in the literature. And we, uh, we obtained the mesh from the crystal structure of the protein. Now, as you can see, again, we, we have a nice convergence. And for 32,000, around 32,000 elements on the, on the sphere, we have errors below 1%. Just bear in mind that in this case, because extinction cross-section is measured on the surface of the nanoparticle, we only refine uh, with the grid convergence analysis on the nanoparticle, and we kept constant the amount of elements, but to a, to a high number that uh, contain two triangles per Armstrong square on the protein. Now, the key question is, can we see now a shift on the extinction cross-section once we add an protein in the vicinity of the nanoparticle. Can we be able to show that our computational approach can replicate this behavior? And we were able to see that when we located, we needed to locate at least two proteins on the vicinity of the nanoparticle to see some change. The first attempt with that was locating two proteins on the C direction which were oriented such that the dipole moment is aligned with the Y axis. The reason for this was to be consistent with previous research done in the group. There is no particular reason for that. Uh, and for this case, we saw that when we put the two proteins, the two BSA proteins meshes created from the crystal structure at one nanometer of distance, there was a shift in the wavelengths of 0 0.5 nanometers. However, when these proteins were located uh, by performing a solid rotation in the y and x axis, the delta lambda was nearly zero. And the reason why it's a zero here is because the value is smaller than the discretization of the wavelengths reported here, uh, of, of the wavelengths that we use uh, uh, for the discretization, which was the increment of 0 0.25 nanometers. Now, we noticed we wanted to explore how sensitive, like how the sensitivity varied when we uh, move the proteins for to different distances. We know that we know that proteins in general, like the nanoparticles in general, are functionalized with some sort of like recognition uh, by a molecule. In this case, we ignore that part on our model because it's just 
it only worries the initial curve. But we wanted to explore what was the effect of using such nanoparticles, such uh, biomolecules that were bigger than certain distance. So it's known that some of these antibodies that are used to functionalize the surface are bigger or around 15 nanometers. Now, would we be able to sense uh, one or two uh, proteins in the vicinity if this, uh, if we use these antibodies that are bigger, such like on the dimensions of 15 nanometers? And the answer is probably not, because we see that as soon as we go to two nanometers of distance, the, the shifts start decreasing. And we, we, we know that if we go above that, we are not going to be able to sense that. Now, for the first part of the project, we, could say, we can say that we checked some goals. We were able to provide a, excuse me, a computational approach for biosensing applications that represents the behavior that we expected. We saw a shift. We put our solver under verification uh, for the case of an isolated nanoparticle. We were able to perform the computations with a realistic and analyte representation. Our computations are relatively fast compared to what it would be performing experiments, just as, a, just as an average value each time each computation took about 15 minutes. And overall, when we are performing those, the curves that we showed before, each curve will take about five hours. We believe that this time could go lower if we will sacrifice the error to be a little bit bigger than just 1%. And this, all the results of this section of the, of, of the work have been published in peer reviewed journals. So now the next question we have was, what were the implications? What are the implications of modeling and the computational model that we have? How accurate should be the analyte model? Do we really need to use the whole crystal structure representation, or can we uh, use models that are simpler? We know there are some existing models that are way too simple, and we want to understand what are the consequences of using these models in the LSPR response. Now. In the literature, we only found few works that, are, that do computational uh, analysis of this type of problems. And in all of them, the representation of the protein or the analyte around the nanoparticle tends to be simple. In the case of Pan et al. and, and co-workers, they use uh, the electric that, is rep that it's a layer, that it's a mix between water is an effective electric that is a mix between water and protein. Then Dan and who use a pyramid representation of the protein. And in all these cases is bovine, serum, albumine. And the simpler models that we've seen a lot are rely on using a spherical representation for the nano, for the, sorry, for the, the protein. Now the question is how these models are compared to using a full representation of the, an accurate representation of the protein extracted from the crystal extractor via solvers like, uh, via softwares like NanoShaper. Are these simple models have, do not account for certain factors that we do account. So we, this, this simple models do not have degrees of freedoms in the protein. There are no charges involved, and the electric chosen usually does not account for losses in the middle. So why is that in these models? Well, the reason why we want to explore this model, we wanted to explore these models, is because these simpler models imply cheaper computations. If I have a simple representation of the protein, I don't need that many boundary elements to describe the protein. Therefore, it will be much, uh, much faster the computations. And we will also be able to include more proteins that don't have a memory bound for this problem. And last but not least, we, we will be able to understand using this model, what's the impact of all these characteristics. So the first attempt we did to generate a reduced order model was representing 
the protein that we use, the BSA, by an ellipsoid, a, in particular a prolate ellipsoid, because we found in the literature that this that this um, this revolution ellipsoid can be a good representation of the protein. Now, how do we choose the dimension of this ellipsoid it was a, quick, a key question that we had. So we proposed two different models. One of the models is a surface equivalent model, which implies generating an ellipsoid that include all the charges inside uh, the protein. And we generated this ellipsoid by using uh, principal component analysis on the vertices of the original mesh and that way obtaining the principal axis of an ellipsoid that would encapsulate all the charges. Now, the second model that we proposed for the protein was using a, an ellipsoid that had the same volume that the original uh, protein. Now, in this case, this, uh, due to the size of the volume of this ellipsoid, this volume equivalent ellipsoid, we were not going to be able to include all the charges, but we could include an approximation uh, of the charges using a monopole approximation for this one. So when it comes to these models, the first question we had to answer was, what is the effect of including charges in our models or not? And we were able to see that if we use as a reference, the ellipsoid that can contain all the charges, that whether we use a full distribution of charges or we use a center of mass charge, like we see that both curves match perfectly here on the plot on the left. However, if we do not include any charges, we see that the intensity of the extinction cross-section diminish a little bit. So if we are interested on in only seeing the shift, we could or could not include the charges so far as we know. Now, what happens with these models and how do they compare with the crystal structure model? Is it, are they accurate enough or not? For that, we perform the same computations that we perform for the case of having the full crystal structure with the same orientation for the ellipsoids that we had for the crystal structure. And we were able to see that the surface equivalent model overestimates the, the shift by four times like more. It's that we have 2.5 nanometers instead of 0.5 nanometers. Well, when we use a volume equivalent model, we see that the shift is closer to what we expect, but it's still an overestimation. Now, the next, the next question we have is what happened when we use spheres? And because we saw many models using spheres, we decided to try this. And we saw that if we use a volume equivalent sphere, the shift obtained was the same with the ellipsoid. But the remaining question was does the orientation matters? And if we use spheres, we will lose the degrees of freedom. So we perform for the volume equivalent um, ellipsoids, we show that the orientation that we chose for the ellipsoids, it does affect how much the shift is in the LSPR response. We were able to see that if we orient this such that the principal axis of our um, ellipsoid is parallel to y, we obtain a shift that is one nanometer compared to the original orientation, which was 0 0.75. And if we orient this such that the principal axis b is parallel to y, then the shift is much smaller. So that shows that using a sphere as a model is not a good option since we will be losing the degrees of freedom effect. Now, the last part that we explore regarding the ellipses was uh, including more proteins or more ellipses in this case, which was something that it was possible given the fact that now the computations were less expensive. So we noticed that when we go from two proteins on each orientation, just original or parallel to A parallel to Y or B parallel to Y, to six proteins, 
for now we locate the remaining proteins on the X and Y locations, we see an increment on the shift, which was suspected. However, the percentage of the increment is not directly proportional to what we would expect. So there is not a direct relationship between the amount of proteins that we include and the increment on the shift. And it also varies depending on how we orient these proteins. So to move on, the next, the next aspect that we explore uh, regarding the modeling was if the, the incident electric field had any effect, the magnitude of this incident electric field had any effect on the results of the LSPR response. We were able to show that when the uh, incoming electric field, the magnitude of the incoming electric field was smaller than the magnitude of the electric field generated by the single by a single charge on the protein on the surface of the sensor, then the shift changes from 0 0.25 to 0 0.5. So this pink curve bulk here not only has higher levels of extinction cross section, but the shift is farther to the to the right. Now the last aspect of the modeling that we wanted to explore, but now going back to the full representation of the crystal structure was the decision from some uh, researchers to use real dielectric values for the protein and for the medium where th that surrounds them. So the first result that we wanted to explore or the first uh, discussion we wanted to make was how does it compare using a complex electric representation for the protein versus using a real value for this? Now, we saw that if we use a complex representation or the, real, the average of the real component of this complex representation, the shift doesn't change. These are the black curve and the gray curve. For these cases, we do have the same shift, however, when we use a real component, the average of the real component, the peak increases a little bit. Now, on the literature, we found that for bovine serum albumin, there were reported different values of the dielectric use. One of them was uh, 3.61, and the other one was approximately 2.1. We noticed that if we use these values for um, the, the the electric of the protein, the shift changed. So we were able to conclude that if we use different protein dielectrics that are real values, then we will have a difference on the shift. So this will impact the conclusions that you will get uh, from this uh, from this uh, studies. So the next step was how does the choice of real dielectrics in the water medium affects the response. And again, we saw that if we use the complex values that in this case we obtain, obtain experimentally versus we use the real component, the average of the real component, the shift doesn't change. But in this case, we don't see a change on the peak uh, as we saw before with the, the protein. We speculate that the reason why we don't see a bigger change on the peak between the black curve and the green curve in this plot is because the losses on this median are much, much, much smaller than in the other case, meaning that the imaginary part of the complex dielectrics are orders of magnitude smaller than what they were compared to the protein. But we, all, we saw that a slight change on the model chosen for the real dielectric, for example, going from 1.79 to 1.76 will imply that the peak will be located in a, different, uh, in a different place. In this case, if we have that change in the electric from 1.79 to 1.76, we see a shift of 0 0.75, which is significant compared to what, what we respect. Uh, now, when using two different water dielectric models, 
we want their light. When we add the proteins in the surrounding, will this imply a different shift? We expected that, we thought that we would see the same shift, but we didn't. So we show that when we use the values from Hale and Query obtained from the literature, we saw that between the, the shift between having just a nanoparticle and then adding two proteins was 0 0.5. Well, when we use the generalization value, which is the value that most uh, researchers use, the shift reported when adding the protein, it was bigger. And this results also get affected when we add to, uh, to the proteins a real electric. So now we not only see that the shift goes uh, varies from 0 0.5 to 0 0.75, but there's also an increment on the peaks. And this is because the losses are not included when we use a real electric. Now, to conclude this part of the project, we were able to show that the reduced order models, a deep insight on the reduced order models for the analyte. We show that the geometric model that we use matters. And in this case, we saw that using a volume equivalent model is better than a surface equivalent model. However, there's still an overestimation on the shift. And the shift varies depending on the protein orientation and the number of proteins in the surround, in the, in the vicinity of the nanoparticle. But this, when adding more proteins, the relationship is not directly proportional. We also were able to show that including charges is whether we do it via a full distribution or if we do it uh, using a monopole charge is the results on the same power when we don't include them, this affects the results on the intensity. Uh, and that the electric field has an effect when these charges are included, only when the incoming electric field magnitude is smaller than the electric field of the charges. And last but not least, we show that the choices for the electric models for the environment around the proteins and the nanoparticle and the choice of the dielectrics for the protein matters, and they will lead to different conclusions depending on the choice. Now, moving on to the last part of our project, we wanted to, excuse me, we wanted to perform replication and validation studies to be able to build trust in our solver. Unfortunately, for all the biosensing applications that we just show, we were not able to find computations or experiments that were comparable with our, with our uh, results making this a dead end. However, we found it wasn't until we found a different field, but a slightly similar, that is the surface found in polaritons field, where we were able to find hope that we, will able, that we will replicate some studies and validate some results. Now, what happens in when, when we have surface phone and polaritons, it's a similar, slightly similar effect than when we have surface uh, plasma and polaritons. Now, in this case, the coupling occurs between the incoming light and the optical phonons and the structure of the material. Now, there are certain materials like silicon carbide that express this behavior in the mid infrared centerahertz. And the good news about this material is that the sensitivity of these materials is much bigger than the ones reported for metallic nanoparticles because there are lower losses. And this can be seen as we analyze the figure of merit of such materials. So what happened is, the figure of merit is a way of measuring sensitivity. It's a metric used in general to measure sensitivity, which relates the shift that happens. So that's delta lambda. When we have the nanoparticle in two different mediums, so that's delta n, divided by what is called the full width mid height uh, parameter, which is how like wide is the curve 
at mid height. Now we can see that for silicon carbide, and these results are from a paper on Roxel uh, and coworkers, the, the, the width is much smaller than what it would be for silver, meaning that the figure of matter will increase, which reports to be a higher sensitivity. Now, when we were exploring this field, we found a result on uh, the work of Roxel and coworker that was interesting for potential replication study. And the reason why we picked this uh, result, it was because the, they performed computations on 2D boundary element methods of silicon carbide uh, scattering cross section. Uh, the, there is a difference between having a 2D boundary element method. They assumed that the third dimension was infinity, while for us, this dimension will be uh, a discrete value. And in this case, we're looking at trying to match the peak at where the resonance happened. And this is the quantity of interest that we are trying to replicate. The, and we can see that for two different blocks or what they call in their, in their uh, studies uh, rectangular prisms, the values for the main two peaks that they reported are perfectly matched, almost perfectly matched. So we have 10.42 and 10.40 are our results, 10.70 and 10.72 are our results, and similarly for the other orientation. Now you will see that in this plot, there are extra peaks on our results that are not present on the Roxel reporter results. These peaks are due to the first one that it shows between the peaks between, between the two reported by them is caused due to the roundness of the geometry. We were able to diminish the value of this peak. However, we do not have control or information on how much roundness on the corner uh, of their uh, structures they use. And the last peak, the fourth peak shown in both cases is merely due to the fact that we have a 3D structure and that we cannot extend our third dimension more to reduce this peak just because we will be able out of the quasi-static limit. Now, moving on, the next results that we found that could lead us to possible validation and more replication studies were the results from Ellis and coworkers from the from the Navy, which with them we have private communications and they encourage us to pursue the replication and possible validation with their results, given that they have uh, experiments for silicon carbide pillars that were on top of a substrate, which we can model, but uh, we have these pillars and they, will me and they measure polarized reflectance on these structures. Now, when they measure reflectance, they will see a deep, when there is a resonance, while we'll see extension. So in this case, the quantity of interest will be the lambda at which we'll see either peaks or dips in their, in their simulations. Now, during the process of trying to replicate one of their results, uh, there was missing information and we had to perform previous simulations to understand what was exactly what they were reporting. So the main, the main replication study we intended to, to analyze was the one that involved what they call the lowest mode that is not a longitudinal mode. mode. And we needed to identify which one were they, these modes. So longitudinal modes are the modes that resonate when we have an off normal um, incidence and they're they are connected to the height of the pillar in this case. Now, we were able to see that if we run simulations with normal incidence and off normal incidence, there's one of the modes that won't, that won't appear. For example, in the, for the aspect ratio one, we were able to see that the peak here in orange, the first one, 
is not present on the blue on the blue curve, which means that when we're looking for the lowest mode that is not a longitudinal mode for this aspect ratio, we will concentrate on this second peak that it's over here. We perform this analysis for all the different aspect ratios with the hope to replicate the result presented on their supplementary material, which was a perfect candidate because they have the pillars with a separation of 5,000 nanometers, which means that there was no interaction between the pillars. And that is a perfect suit for us because we did not have interaction included in our case. And for this results, we, we, we can see here in the plot that for each aspect ratio, the wavelengths for the lowest, or the wave number in this case, for the lowest mole that was not a longitudinal mole was very close and in all the cases, we reported an error that was lower than 1.6%. Now, these results were inspiring, and we attempted to pursue the validation using the aspect ratio for pillars, which were the ones that had the least amount of error, and also they were able to provide us the mesh that they utilized for this case in their computations. So, for the validation study, uh, they reported experiments that for an aspect ratio four pillar, they have with interaction, which was not the gray suit for us, they have a 500 nanometers gap between them. And they reported the curve in red as the results that they obtained for the reflectance uh, with parallel polarization. Now, as you can see here, our results are off by a certain amount that you can see the first peak in blue does not match the deep, the first deep in red. The, the first deep in red here, far, far on the left, they reported to not be part uh, in the paper, they reported to not be a mode that was of their interest. So we ignored that, uh, that mode, uh, but the main mode is not matching. However, we found on the supplementary material that for this mode, which is the first, the lowest mode for the parallel polarization, call, they call them like E100, that the difference between coupling effects and non-coupling effects on, the, on these uh, dips was of 12.7 centimeters minus one. We obtained this difference by digitizing some data from their results. They never provide the data of their results. And when we perform this correction, we call it like a first order correction, we could see now that our results minus this interaction effects will actually lead us to match almost perfectly uh, the main peaks that they report. So we consider that with the first order correction, we obtain a validation for our result, for our uh, solver. And the last part that Ellis and co works are reported was also simulations over their experiments, where is the green curve. And in this case, when we perform the first order correction, we get a good match, but it's still not the best. But in this case, the simulation are not directly comparable since they use a finite element and they still have the rate of pillars, but they have it over a substrate. So we're not including those effects. And um, we, we are doing a first order correction. So for concluding this section, we were able to replicate the findings of two different computational results presented in 2004 and 2006 by Roxil and coworkers and Ellis and coworkers, and then validate our solver against experiments on reflectance spectroscopy. Now, to conclude our work, we could say that we were able to provide a computational approach for biosensing applications that has an accurate representation for the protein and um, that went under a verification process for the isolating nanoparticle following me theory and their analytical solution. We gave a, a deep insight on 
the consequences of using reduced order models for the protein, where we show that the protein geometry models chosen affects the results as well as the degrees of freedoms involved in the geometry. We were able to say that the charges included in the model have an effect and you cannot completely neglect them. And their effect also varies depending on the intensity of the electric field, as well as the choice of the dielectric models uh, has an impact on what are the conclusions that we will drive from poor sensitivity studies. And last but not least, we provide replication studies and evaluation case, and we, with the hope that this will trust on our solver. With that being said, I will finish my presentation and I would like to thank you. And I'll guess I'll, I'll be open to questions. Are you all reading it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think if you can uh, stop the re the recording now. Uh, yeah. Oh. Try stop recording. Mm -hmm.